as we're finishing up our, our series on the Sermon on the, the Mount today, the, the question I want to put in front of you this morning is, is a simple question. And that question is simply this, what is the role of a Christian in this world? What, what is the role? What, what is our role? If you could scale it down, what, what is actually the role that we play? And, and I think historians, you know, I've uh, been in the line of work that I'm in, you know, you read a lot and, and I've read a lot of books and I've read a lot of books even on that topic. What's the role of the church? What, what is the role of the church in the world? Well, that's obviously way too big of an issue to talk about on a Sunday morning for a few minutes. But Jesus did say something about that. What is the role of of a Christian in this world. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And in the Sermon on the Mount, the very last one that we're going to deal with in this called series, um, it's uh, Jesus makes a statement that you've heard before, Matthew chapter 5. If you don't know where Matthew's at, if you're on a a tablet or a device, it's the New American Standard is the version I'm using, uh, Matthew chapter 5. If you've got a Bible in your hands, and I hope you do, uh, if you're at home, I hope you've got a Bible with you. And it's kind of in the middle of your Bible. It's the start of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount. He's kind of at the beginning. And Jesus makes a statement that's really, it's, it's, it's really overbearing in the most positive way. It's hard to imagine the eternal Son of God saying this about you and this about me. He said in verse 13 of chapter 5, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Second statement, you are the light of the world. And he's talking about you. By the way, just stop for a second. Everybody look up here for a minute. He's not talking about somebody else. He's talking about you. He's not talking about some far off person that's got all kinds of theological degrees. He's talking to mechanics and plumbers and bankers and stay at home moms and freshmen and seniors and eighth graders. He's talking about senior citizens. He's talking about 30 year olds. He's talking about divorced people. He's talking about people that are married again. He's talking about single Christians. He's talking about people that have fallen under the name of the Lord Jesus. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand, that's where they put it, and and it gives light to all who are in the house. Therefore, or let your light shine before men, before mankind, in such a way that they may see your good works. Now now think about it. There's a condition here. They'll see your good works and... Glorify your Father who is in heaven. So what you do brings glory to God in heaven. So today we're going to talk specifically about, in this called series, about to be, what it means to be called where you are. Called where you are. That's what we're getting at today. God has called you where you are. Oswald Chambers said it one time, and I think the quote goes something like this. Bad grammar it may be. But the reality is you can't serve God where you're not at. And, and I've always th- thought about that. You, you know, you can't grow where you're not planted, right? So, so wherever you are right now, whatever corporation you're in, whatever school you're in, whatever geometry class you're in, whatever situation in life you're in, you are called to that place right there in that moment. So we're going to talk about what it means to be called where you are. And if, and if I could put it all into one simple takeaway this morning, I would probably say it to you like this, that God wants me to be what I am, where I am. Don't forget that. God wants me to be what I am, where I am. And, and what I am is God's change agent. When you read that verse, you understand that you are God's agent of change. You're the force multiplier. You're you're the X factor, right? You're the X factor. Now, you may not feel like an X factor. You may not feel like, you know, that you're all that in a bag of chips, but I want to tell you something. In In the eyes of God, you matter. In the eyes of God, you matter. God wants me to be where I am. He wants me to be what I am. In fact, I would put it together and say, God wants me to be what I am, where I am. And what I am, according to Scripture, is God's 
change Egypt. So, so in, at the end of the day, if we're God's missionaries, there's a question that I think we, we, we look at. And when you look at this verse about light of the world and salt of the earth, what does it reveal? That's the question I had, right? What does this reveal about how God looks at me. When, you, when Jesus says, you're the light of the world, and when Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, what in the world is he trying to say? And what does, what does that verse, when Jesus just said, hey, wait a minute, you guys, I hope you, you all know you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth. What does that have to say about God's heart and really God's optic on how God sees me. What does that mean? It reveals something. And I think what it reveals is that I am, in fact, God's change agent. I'm God's change agent. I'm, I'm, that, I'm that agent of change. I, I, God has called me where I am. He's called me to be what I am, where I am. So I am, so if you're taking notes, write that down. I am God's change agent. That's what, light of the world, salt of the earth. That's what God is telling me. Now, let me tell you why this matters and why it would have mattered. Let me give you a little context of why this would have mattered in that day. And why you got to remember the crowd, right? Jesus isn't just speaking out into the, the open airwaves, like on a radio signal that's just broadcasting, all right? He, he, he's not just saying that to everybody. He's saying it to the crowd of his followers. But who's in that crowd? Well, think about it for a minute. People who have been in that crowd, first of all, would have been a whole lot of Gentiles, now, if you're not familiar with Christianity very much, or maybe you're checking us out online and you're, you're, you're kind of investigating faith a little bit, and it, it, what, what, who were Gentiles? Gentiles were people that were not Jews. And so because they're not Jews, they're, they're not, they're not going to be in temple, and, and they're restricted. They're the other people, right? You, you ever been around the other people? Sometimes I think I am the other people. I don't know, I, you know? I grew up in a town where there was another side of the tracks. There's, that's no kidding. I grew up in a town where there, there was very clear dividing lines at times. Some of you maybe have been around that, even maybe even your own family, you've been around what it means to be someone else. So there would have been Jews and Gentiles in that crowd. Now, the Gentiles were the people that were not God's favorite. In the culture's eyes, they would have said, oh, you're not one of us. But then there were Jews in that crowd too. And those Jews were beaten down Jews. They were people that were literally under the oppression and the hammer, you know, the constant elbow drop of, of the, the religious elite. There was a religious crowd called Pharisees and Sadducees. And, and, and so those guys were always basically letting everybody else know, no matter how hard you try, no matter what you're going to do, you're never going to be on God's favorite team like I am. Okay? You're, I'm, I'm, I'm one of God's favorite. And, and you can tell that because I dress better than you. My prayer shawl is longer than you. I pray longer prayers than you pray. I know more scripture than you do. You see where it's going, right? He's separating everybody. And so for Jesus to say to all the outcasts, hey, don't tell them, but they're not going to make it. Right? Don't let them know. They're not going to make it. Because their arrogance won't let them repent. Their arrogance makes them think that they're special. And they are special, but so are you. And so for a Gentile and for a Jew to have a Messiah look him in the eye and say, your life counts. And they had never heard that. For a Messiah to say, I'm not just coming here to go to a cross for them. I'm going to a cross for you. Because I want you to know you're the light of the world. And you're the salt of the earth. To hear this would have been like life-giving. Nobody ever told him stuff like that. In fact, you know what Jesus said about Pharisees? There's a, there's a stretch in Matthew. Now, I don't want you to turn there, but I, since I've got it on my mind, I, I think it's Matthew. Um, it's in the, the woe section. 
This is one of those times. There it is. Um, Matthew 23. You should go read it. Go read Matthew chapter 23 sometime in the next few days. And Jesus goes on this rant about Pharisees. And he says a whole bunch of stuff. And if you ever think I'm a bold preacher, wow. Just read. Because I'm not calling anybody in here sons of hell. (laughs) Snakes. Broods of vipers. That's Jesus. He was mad. He was mad. And you know what he said about the Pharisees? When it comes to religion, he said, you tie up heavy burdens on people's backs, religiously speaking. You make all these rules. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because your parents could be watching. How many of you grew up in a house full of religious rules? Oh, man, some of you, I know your stories. Wow. I mean, there were rules, right? Heavy sometimes. Or maybe it wasn't your parents. Maybe it was just your preacher. Heavy, hard. I mean, God was always pretty much a little bit put out with you, right? Right? That was the Pharisees. And only they had the secret decoder ring. And that was kind of how it worked. And so Jesus said about them, you make up all these heavy burdens and you put them on the back of people that I created, but yet you won't lift a finger to help them. You sons of hell. I mean, he wasn't playing around. So for Jesus to say, you, you count to me, oh man, it would have been life-giving. It would have been so life, life-giving to them. But I want to interject a thought in all this with you this morning for just a second. When it comes to you're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world, because um, you got to understand what salt and light is about in, in this particular context of, of Scripture. You, you hear this phrase all the time, oh, they're salt of the earth people, meaning that's just a phrase. They're just good people, you know, good folks. For somebody to be salt of the earth, understand something. Salt, as some of you probably know, maybe you don't, salt was a preservation agent. It was a preservative. So you would have used salt as a preserving agent. You would have put it on meat. You would have done many things with it to keep things from going bad. But I want to—I want you to back up a second and realize something. You don't need a preservative unless there's decay, right? You don't need a preservative if nothing can go bad. You ever bought something organic? It goes bad way faster. You got to eat that thing, Right? Then you got stuff that you can buy that you can sit it out in the hot sun and it'll be just fine in 2027, right? There's preservatives in there. So, so what, why would you need salt? You only need salt if things are rotten. So Jesus is saying something here. You are God's change agent. You matter. Your voice counts. Your voice counts. Why? Because you don't need salt unless things are on their way to being foul. Right? You tracking? You don't need salt if things aren't decaying. If everything's okay, then you don't need salt. But you need salt. And Jesus said, you're salt. And then he also said, you're light. You're light. Now, why would he say that? Because darkness doesn't self-correct. I want you to think about that. Darkness doesn't self-correct. If something is dark, somebody's got to flip a switch or turn on their phone app, right? If something's dark, darkness doesn't take care of itself. Something's got to be a change agent, and that's you. Somebody's got to flip the switch, and that's you. See, we're not talking here about moral correction. And I really do wonder sometimes if that's why the Christian church, the evangelical church, not just Baptists, just evangelicals in general, I really wonder if that's why for so many decades, especially in America, if the church has seemed to struggle so much. Because when it's just about moral issues, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. 
If it's just about being moral, well, anybody can be good. Seriously, you've heard me say it before. I'm going to say it many times as long as you go here. You don't need Jesus to be good. You don't. I know a lot of really good people that that are not going to go to heaven when they die. They're actually good people. But you don't need Jesus to be good. There's all kinds of good people in the world. But you do need Jesus to go to heaven. You do need Jesus to be redeemed. You do need Jesus if you want your sins forgiven. And that's what's going to get you into heaven. But moral reform isn't going to do it. And so I wonder sometimes when Jesus says things like you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, I wonder if Christians even realize the fact that it's not about morality. Discipleship has never been about keeping all the rules. Pharisees were already good at that. Nobody was better rule keepers than Pharisees. Nobody was better religious rule keepers than Sadducees. Nobody was better. And yet they weren't going to go to heaven at all. And Jesus told them so. So we're not here to be people who are agents of moral reform. And I really do think that evangelicals sometimes miss it there. Because we tend to tackle all the symptoms, right? We go after all the symptoms in society without going after the actual disease at play. And the disease at play is sin. Sin makes all the other symptoms happen. So what are we called to do? We are called to be agents of change, agents of power, agents of preservation to let people know we're going to shine a light on something, right? We're going to shine a light on the actual truth because what happens in today's world is when you get all this chaotic stuff going on, people want to tend to put the truth under a basket and not reveal it. And, you know, aren't you just a little bit tired of all of the different storylines that you're, you don't know what to believe anymore. Well, no, you actually do know what to believe if you choose to use a filter. And this filter is not going to deceive you. And that's, while we're talking about that for a second, let me just hit time out for a second. That's why, while I'm thinking about it, this wasn't, I'm moving off script for a second, but I'm going to take a second here. Look, this is why you got to know this thing. You, 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 you got to know the Word of God. And to know the Word of God, you actually have to read it. And I'm not being sarcastic. You actually have to spend time in it. But let me tell you, it's not my way of trying to get you to read your Bible more. You don't need anybody trying to get, make you to do that. No, I want you to know the Word of God so that when you, you have the, uh, the ability, you have the actual toolbox to filter out deception. So that you actually can filter out deception. So that when you hear that all the world's falling apart, you can go, no, it's not. When you hear that, oh, you, you should be scared. No, I don't have to. I mean, i got to be cautious. Yeah, sure. But I don't have to freak out. I don't, I don't, I don't have to lose my mind. Because i I, I got a different author telling me something. See, the Word of God is critical. If we're going to be agents of change and agents of power, we, we got to know the Word of God. Or... Your mind and your heart and your soul is going to be up for sale to the highest bidder. And I don't want that for you. So why does salt and light matter? And why does it matter right now? That's the big question. Why, why, why does this matter to God? That's the first question in my mind. Why, why, if Jesus says we're salt of the earth and we're the light of the world, I'm going to ask why does it matter to God? And specifically, why does it matter right now? Right? Why does this matter right now? That's what I want to tackle with you for just a second. If you're the salt of the earth and if you're the light of the world, why does it matter to God and why does it matter right now? Your life, friend, listen to me, Christian. If Jesus isn't playing around, if he actually is being honest, and we know that he is, then he's not just trying to make you feel good. I really want you to know that. Because there's people in that crowd that I just told you, he's trying not to make feel good. So Jesus is saying, you're the salt of the earth. He actually means it. And Jesus is saying, you're the light of the world. He actually means it. He's not just pumping you up full of air. What that tells me is that your life matters in a dark world. Your life matters. Listen to me. If you wonder sometimes, if you wonder sometimes, don't raise your hand. 
But if you wonder sometimes if your life matters, the Son of Holy God is telling you that it does. If you wonder sometimes if you have a purpose in this world, the Son of Holy God who came to this earth, walked on the earth for 33 years, died on a cross, went to a grave, came out of that grave, and then sent a Holy Spirit to empower you. He is telling you your life matters. And he's also telling you your voice matters. Your voice matters. Your voice matters. Listen to me. Your voice matters. Maybe I, I, I know it's maybe, be a, maybe a, a, a big statement to say it this way. But in light of what we've experienced in 2020, I don't know if there's ever been a time in my lifetime where the voice of the redeemed Christian matters more. The voice of the redeemed Christian, the voice of the spirit-filled believer, your, your voice, your role, man, your role in your corporation right now I mean, the circus has been in town for a year, people. Mentally, right? Mentally. I, I, I don't know anybody that at this point right now, I mean, churches are letting Buddy the Elf show up. That's how weird it's got, okay? Why? Because we need to laugh, man. We need to laugh. We need something to sing joy to the world. You know, maybe... In, in your workplace right now, the vast majority of people, by statistic, are not believers. Your voice carries so much weight for God. Your voice is so influential, but you got to use it. When, when you encounter deception, hearing a friend, when you encounter them believing a lie... That's your moment. Don't take your light and stick it in your pocket. Don't take your preserving agent and leave it in your purse. No, when you hear people that are scared, when you hear people that are freaking out, when you hear people that are worried about their job and is it going to be there after the first of the year, that's your moment right there, right there. That's your, your voice matters. Oh, man, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You students, all of you, college, middle school, high school, listen to me. You have a chance right now to speak the truths of God, maybe in a time when people are actually listening a little bit. Because we know that this whole world has been under the influence of so many mixed messages. We know it. Culture is, is struggling right now. Mental health issues are off the chart. Depression, anxiety. I mean, friends, that's, that, that, those aren't made up numbers. The reason you're hearing so much about mental health right now is because it's real. People are, are tired. They're mentally tired. And when I say mental health, I don't mean people that have to be you know, uh, taken to an, an, an asylum. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the actual health, vibrancy of the mind. Mental health is really down People are, 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 I read an article this, uh, this week, Japan, Japan keeps, uh, one of our people here on staff sent it to me, Japan keeps more, they, they keep more up-to-date suicide statistics than, than maybe any other country out there. They keep very real-time suicide statistics. America, we're a, we're a little bit behind, on, uh, behind them. They keep real-time data. And last month, if I read the article right, Japan had more suicides in November than all COVID deaths combined, right? I mean, mental health is a big issue right now. How people are seeing, is there hope? Is there a reason to live? And I'm saying, yes, absolutely there's. And your voice, is, it matters. People are scared to death. Our world is, is unstable. But more than any other thing, what really I think is making people pull their hair out is the hypocrisy that we see. Hypocrisy is everywhere. And, and, and the Wild West has kind of been the name of the game for the last nine months because there's no consistency, if you haven't noticed. Like people just making up rules as they go. Right? So, so what do we do with that? 
What do we do with that? Well, we're the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world. And so your voice matters in a culture. It matters right now. Let me tell you why it matters. Because if you remove the light, and if you take away the preserving agent, then the only voice that's left to speak into our culture is the septic voice. The only voice left is the dark voice. The only voice left is the voice of deception about what's happening in our world or what's happening with the economy or what's happening with politics or what's happening with COVID or what's happening with school systems or what's happening with anything. If you take out the preserving agent and if you take out the light, the only thing left to speak into anything is the dark voice. Your life matters. You are God's change agent. God wants you to be what you are, where you are. And where you are is right where God wants you. And what you are is God's missionary. You count. Your voice matters. And that's why, personally, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you think I, 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 I bring it up too much. I don't know. I haven't really gotten any feedback on that. And if you want to give me feedback, send it to uh, somebody else at clearview.org. Um, that was just a joke. Lighten up, man. That was pretty good on my feet, right? That wasn't bad. Um, but, but, but truthfully speaking, the reason I keep bringing up why Clearview is going to stay in the fight and why Clearview is going to just find a way to keep meeting and why we're going to find a way to keep doing what we're doing is because there are, there are voices at play in our culture that are deceiving people and I am a shepherd of one group of people. And if for no other place on this little planet Earth, one drop a little pin on one little map, I'm going to do everything I can to keep the truth in front of you. Amen. To keep the truth right in front of you. Where you can hear it and see it and know it. And know that while, yes, there's all these messages coming in, that no, you have a different option out there. Because if, but if we mute that voice, if we, if we let that voice go silent, if we don't, put our combined voices together, then the only voice out there is the septic voice. We are the light of the world, and we're the salt of the earth. And I want to keep reminding you, friends, Jesus knew times were going to get difficult when he said that. Do you, do you understand that? It sounds very simple. Jesus knew there were going to be wars when he said, you're the salt of the earth. Jesus knew there were going to be pandemics. Do you think this is the first one that's ever happened? This is the first one we've lived through. Jesus knew that there was going to be political deception for centuries. Jesus knew that there was going to be rampant immorality when he said, you're the preserving agent. You're the voice of truth. Jesus knew. He knew. So what happens what happens if the church doesn't fight? What happens if the church just lets itself be controlled? The only voice out there is the controlling voice of the enemy. And we're not doing that. Because this isn't the last time, Christian friend. I really want you to understand this. This is not the last time we're going to see the church come under pressure. Read the last book. There's coming a day when it's not going to be the threat of getting a disease that is going to cause you pause. There's coming a day when you read the Word of God that it is going to be an agent of some power saying yes or no on Jesus. And they've got a weapon or a needle or something and it's over for you right then. Now, that's not like in Revelation, actually the needle part. No, I'm speaking metaphorically. There's coming a day when if, you, if you're here in the last days, and, and I don't know if we will be, but if we are here in those last days, it is going to cost you your life if you choose to keep the name of Christ. This is not the last time it's going to be hard for the Christian church. I believe... You're getting a good feel right now 
maybe a warm-up, tell you a story that I've been thinking about all week long. A friend of mine is a pastor, and they do a lot of ministry in a, um, a city in, a, in another country where uh, it's illegal to be a Christian, actually illegal. They don't go executing Christians, but they also don't tolerate it. So it's not as bad as maybe uh, Afghanistan, but, but it's, it's pretty, pretty aggressive. And so they support some missionaries in this country, in this, this not pretty good-sized town. And, and if I said the name of the city, you'd, you'd, you've heard of it. And um, he said, man, I was over there, and uh, we go into this person's apartment, and they got like 30 people. See, that's the difference. People talk about right now in COVID, well, people met in homes forever, you know, in the New Testament. Yeah, they did. They actually met in homes in the cover of darkness. They weren't keeping people out of their houses. They were trying to get in those houses in the New Testament church to try to keep from being killed. They weren't going to stop meeting. So my friend goes in and he says, the pastor, they had house churches all over the town and, and people would come at night or come early in the morning and they would just one by one, two by two, families wouldn't even come together. They would, they would kind of sneak in and they would pack in this house, you know. And so he said, I'm sitting there going, wow, this is pretty, pretty, pretty feeling like the book of Acts, you know. And, and, and he said, so the, the pastor was, we, he was obviously with me and, and he said, so we, we go in there that day and he tells the small group, and this is just like last year. When this happened, 2019, he says, um, hey, I want you guys to know before we start worship this morning that uh, we have pretty good friends in the intelligence community and here in the city. And I just want you to know that they've told us that our church is on the radar, that they know we're meeting. And so I just want you to know that if anybody comes through the door, don't fight them. Don't protect my life. I'll be arrested. It, we'll work it out in the courts, or hopefully. And so my friend's sitting there going, wow, like this is a long way from Tennessee. <laughs> and he said, it just hit me. The pastor's giving them instructions on how to respond when, you know, the Islam police come. And he said, so we did the worship and everything was fine. And he said, two weeks later, that home, they came busted in that door and they drugged that man out of there. And he's in prison. You see, there's coming a day when what makes you think we're exempt from that? We're not. And it's going to cost you something to carry the name of Christ. We are in spiritual battles. I, I love what Paul said. Look at, look at this. Ephesians 6. Paul said, finally, be strong, not weak, in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against what? Rulers, authorities, authorities. Powers of this dark world and spiritual forces where? In the heavenly realms. We are in an actual battle, and it is a spiritual one. You matter. You're God's change agent. God wants you to be what you are, where you are. And what you are is God's missionary. And you matter. And I want to say to you, friends... No matter what we do, stay in the fight. Stay in the fight at your job. Stay in the fight at your school. Stay in the fight in your relationships, in your neighborhoods, in your mom's day outs, in your, in your play dates. Stay in, stay in the fight with your friends that get together. Stay in the fight. Figure out creative ways to be in the fight, but stay in the fight. You are the salt of the earth. Why does it matter? I'll tell you why it matters. And I want to put this on you for you to understand. It's why I've been such an advocate that the church cannot stop. And I'm not alone. There's many pastors doing that. We cannot stop and we will not stop. And we will be God's agent of movement. Why? I'll tell you why. When you think about salt and when you think about light, think about this. It is impossible to be a change agent in isolation. Salt can't preserve anything if it refuses to touch it. 
Are you with me? Salt can't preserve if it refuses to touch it. Salt can't preserve anything that's decaying if it doesn't get involved in the game. Light can't show light if it refuses to turn itself on. So we cannot retreat from our world. We are all having to figure out different ways to navigate our world right now. Absolutely. But we cannot retreat. For we are the salt of the earth. And we are the light of the world. And we are God's change agent. His holy ones called for a world just like this. God wants me to be what I am, where I am. Right now. So I want to ask you this morning before we pray, this Christmas season, you have got such an open door. I realize that it's counterintuitive to invite people to things right now, but let me tell you something. Scan your world. Listen to me. Would you scan, just scan your world? Say, man, what, what friend have I not heard from for a while? Who's at work that their countenance you know, people you work with, their countenance is down. I can hear it in their voice. Something's not right. Listen, go reach those people. You might be stunned to see just how much they're willing to listen to this Savior who gave you hope and is helping you navigate a weird world right now. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter, but sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world to sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.